Welcome everyone. Good to, I know most of you. That's already exciting. Or maybe not, because only my friends come to hear me talk. Maybe that's a problem. I don't know. But welcome. Glad to have you here. Thank you for coming out to talk about uh, empathy. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet going around. If you just initial it, for those who have registered. If you're not registered, but you're here, just write your name in with your department and your college. Uh, great. So I am uh, Peter Eubanks. I'm a CFI faculty teaching associate. I'm also an associate professor of French in the Department of Foreign Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. Uh, we're going to be talking today about can empathy be taught in the classroom, and I'll just cut to the chase. My argument today is going to be yes. The issue is we're not going to debate whether or not it can actually be taught. We're going to talk about ways in which it might be taught and why that might be good. So I'm already leading the witness. If you have any objections, this is an open forum. Feel free to have your own thoughts and not just to go with whatever structure I'm trying to impose on you. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do, well, first let me just show you what we're going to be talking about today. And we're already having technical difficulties. Today we're going to discuss our own definitions of empathy. That's the first thing I want to do. When you think of empathy, what do you think of? Then I'll show you some definitions from the literature on empathy in pedagogy. Uh, then we'll talk about why that might be important. What's the desirability of teaching empathy in the first place? Uh, then I'm going to talk about briefly two models or taxonomies for teaching empathy. Many of us are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy of teaching. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. I'm really just going to show you the slide and move on. But I want to look at two other taxonomies for teaching empathy specifically. And then by the end of class, I want you to have something actionable to walk away with. We're going to take a little bit of time for each one of you to create at least a blueprint or a draft or some kind of, maybe even just an outline or a sketch or something of an activity, an assignment, uh, an assessment that you can incorporate specifically in one of your classes to uh, teach or engage in what I'm going to call empathy-based learning or empathic thinking. We talk a lot about critical thinking, analytical thinking, linear thinking, spatial thinking, um, Coherent thinking, uh, you know, this is what we're trying to teach our students. That's what college is about, right? Teaching people to think at the heart of it. At least that's what I think it is. And I would like to add to our list of thinkings, empathic thinking, empathy-based thinking as a, as a process that we can use in our classrooms across the curriculum, not just in the humanities, the social sciences, the health sciences, but in things like engineering and physics and areas where sometimes uh, people think, well, how can, isn't it more difficult to teach empathy or an empathic process in those fields? Uh, I want to have a discussion about that. There are some, in, some people have indicated that that's not the case. I'm going to give examples from engineering and physics specifically where people have tried to engage in empathic uh, thinking and feel like they've had some success. So, uh, you all have note cards, or at least most of you do, now the rest of you will soon. Uh, hi, welcome. Can we get the sign-up sheet, the, the sign sheet over here? It's just initial if you could. Thank you. Um, who else needs a note card? Thank you. Yeah. So if you could just write a definition of empathy on your note card, or if you have a notepad of your own, that's fine too. What's a definition for you of empathy? And then we're going to share these. So. Okay, why don't we have everyone, there's only 11 of us, my definitions of empathy I've stolen from other people uh, that I'll show you in a second, but uh, there's only 11 of us, so I'm interested to hear what you, what your thoughts are about what empathy really is. So Andreas, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, putting oneself into somebody else's shoes. Good, very succinct, I think it's probably a lot of people had similar things. <coughs> Experience of thinking, feeling, understanding from another person's perspective, i.e. putting yourself in their shoes. <laughs> okay, right? Yeah. Hi, I'm Christy. I didn't have shoes. Um, <laughs> I had two different Locked parts. <laughs> two different parts is my definition. Um, kind of reflecting, I think, what Jennifer is doing. But number one, the ability to emotionally respond with compassion, but maybe that's also what empathy means in itself. The ability to emotionally respond to another's experience, or the ability to cognitively inhabit another's perspective. Cognitively inhabit another perspective. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. That's well worded. So it's not just the ability to be able to understand, from what you're saying, to understand what someone else is thinking or going through, put yourself in their shoes, but then also to have compassion mm. for that. Not to say, well, I see what that would be like, but then also to have that added measure of compassion for that situation. Veronica. 
being aware of, consider, and understand others' viewpoints, perspectives, and why they think the way they think. Why they, why they think, not just be an awareness that they think a certain way, but the understanding for the whole narrative framework behind the way they think. Yeah, I think that's important. Linda? Uh, I had the ability to understand someone else's point of view or situation and make them feel understood. Uh, and that added measure of making them feel understood, not just you get it, but you have to make clear to that person that you get it, that you are in their shoes. Not just the ability to be in their shoes, but to communicate clearly that you are to the person. Okay, great. Melissa? And the ability to feel and or understand the emotions of someone, even though you may not have experienced the same emotion or situation. Okay, okay, great. Uh, Daisy? Mine is less succinct. succinct. Um, experiencing what others are experiencing, feeling seen, understanding from their perspective, and I'm quoting Brené Brown here, but getting down in the pit with someone so that there's not the power imbalance that pity or sympathy can create. Good. So you're distinguishing between pity, you know, pity and sympathy on the one hand and actual empathy, mm -hmm. which, is, which is different. Mm -hmm. Getting down into the pit with them, not just, I guess, crying at the top of the pit. That's so sad you're in the pit. Oh my gosh, I feel for you in the pit. What must that be like? Uh, but you're actually going down into the pit with them, walking the way, walking with them in their shoes. Yeah. Uh, being able to understand other people's perspectives, caring about other people outside my immediate family, and acting towards others in a caring way. Okay, yeah, I think that's great. The word caring is going to come up in one of these taxonomies. They have a taxonomy of learning, it's Fink, has a, has a taxonomy of learning in which he actually mentions caring as one of his six steps. So I'm glad you brought up that word. Susan? In my opinion, the ability maybe to think or to uh, talk or understand um, others' situation, such as uh, their values, their ideas, their ages, and their feelings. Mm. Yeah, interesting, yeah. Their values. We're gonna to talk today a little bit about how to find value, how empathy, according to some definitions that are prominent, is also about finding value in that other perspective, not just understanding it or even uh, connecting with it in some meaningful way, but understanding it, seeing it as valuable as having value, even though it may be different or, or odd compared to yourself. Or, um, uh, understanding others, uh, others' feelings, points of view, sharing others' pains. Right, sharing mm -hmm. others' pains, I think in the pit with them, I think that's very similar. Good, so we have a lot of overlap uh, in some of the definitions of empathy uh, that we have. Here's some definitions that I'd like to share. They're, 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 they're pretty brief um, from, from the literature on this. This is going to be very cursory today. So the word empathy actually comes from a German word at the beginning of the 20th century. The, the word hasn't even been around all that long, uh, which suggests that it's a relatively new concept. Not that concepts can't precede words that describe them, but once a word comes into existence, something has obviously happened to that concept. So it was uh, Theodor Lips who coined the term empathy at the turn of the 20th century to describe what the audience must do to understand a work or performance of art. Mm -hmm. That's actually how it started. It wasn't so much about reaching out to fellow human beings, it was that process that you must go through in order to understand uh, a work or a performance of art. Getting into the mind of a character on the stage, for example. Um, ha understanding a work of music and the intentionalities that may be involved in the creation of that music. Which we're gonna come back to later on because we're gonna talk about empathy and reading, particularly reading fiction. There's an interesting link there that's been studied in various fields from just literary studies to neuroscience that I want to talk about in a bit. So Wiggins and McTighe is one of the uh, models or taxonomies I'm going to be using today. Um, they uh, wrote a book called Understanding by Design. And this is a definition of empathy that they have. And empathy is one of their six major building blocks of designing a course. Course design. Empathy, they say, is the deliberate act of trying to find what is plausible, sensible, or meaningful in the ideas and actions of others, even if those ideas and actions are puzzling or off-putting. I'll stop there for a second. So it's not just about being able to put yourself in another person's shoes or another person's perspective, or even just going into the pit with them. It's understanding the what's sensible, meaningful, plausible in their ideas, finding value in that other perspective, in that other narrative, that other way of looking at things, that other worldview. So finding value in it. 
Uh, and I think that's an important distinction that a lot of people make. And we can disagree with it, but I'm saying it is an, an important distinction that a lot of people make when they talk about empathy in the classroom. Finding value in the other, not just putting yourself in the shoes of the other or seeing where they're coming from, but actually finding value in something that is off-putting or puzzling. Empathy can lead us not only to rethink a situation, but also to have a change of heart as we come to understand what formerly seemed odd or alien. So empathy is an act that actually changes us in some meaningful way, it changes our heart, is the language that they use. Um, it actually changes who we are in some significant sense. It's not something we do, it's something that we become. It's a process of becoming rather than a box to check off. Well, I was empathetic today because I donated you know, X number of dollars to the hurricane victims in Florida. I was empathetic today. Check, I'm empathetic. It's more of a person that you become. I am the kind of person who gives money to hurricane, who does this, who does that. It's about becoming and being rather than it is about doing, although what we do turns us into who we are. And then the very basic, simple definition, very similar, and your, your definition is a lot more complex, but this is underscoring a lot of what we heard, identification with understanding of another situation, feelings, and motives, right? A very basic. Uh, definition. So the next thing I'd like to discuss is why might teaching empathy be desirable? So I'd like you to turn to a partner. Most of you are very well situated next to a partner. And if you could just take a few minutes to discuss with your partner why teaching empathy might be desirable. Why would we want to do that? And feel free to push back. There is a book that recently came out, maybe you've seen it, it's called Against Empathy. I haven't read it yet, but I probably should, since I talk about empathy and think about it. But it's against empathy, actually saying that's not a value in the way that we think. So feel free to push it against us, or to see maybe limitations or, or things. I mean, uh, for example, there was an Israeli film that came out about five years ago that tried to get into the mind of a Palestinian suicide bomber. And it follows his life and his fears and his, his, his humanity. He, he laughs, he jokes, he interacts with children, he has a family. He, you know, he's this human person. He has, he has the experiences that a normal human being has. And they really humanize him and tried to show why he might be driven to end up by the end of the film, I'll give it away, trying to blow himself up in a marketplace in Jerusalem, in the, in the middle of the city, in a busy marketplace. And it was very controversial in Israel because it's an Israeli, Israeli film. Uh, it was very controversial because a lot of people said, well, how dare we try to humanize something so evil? How dare we try to understand and thereby create an apologia for something that deserves no defense? To, to empathize too much is essentially to defend or apologize for. And so maybe there are limits to empathy you want to think about. So I'm not trying to lead the witness too much when I say, why might teaching empathy be desirable? But you're here today, so presumably, in some sense, you probably think it's worthwhile and, and, and maybe thinking or talking about. So if you could just take a few minutes, take maybe 10 minutes or so to discuss with a partner why teaching empathy might be desirable, and then we'll share with the rest of the class. Okay, the room's getting kind of quiet. These people are maybe coming to a conclusion. Um, can you share uh, some of the takeaways from your discussion with your partner? What are some of the ideas that were generated as you were talking uh, with your partner? But why might teaching empathy be desirable? Maybe we'll start with Linda and Melissa. Okay. <laughs> I like what you said. I'm going to let you go with that. Well, we're in a, a somewhat unique situation. Both of us are clinical service providers in health and behavioral services. Mm -hmm. And so our students, and our main role is clinical, our students are working with patients or clients every day. So for us, it's almost kind of obvious. You know, mm -hmm. like I have a 23-year-old doctoral student trying to work with an 85-year-old hearing impaired man, you know. Or, and so for us, it's really kind of, and they, and, and they can't, you know, it's hard for them to identify and to be so I'm just really interested in how to teach it, honestly. I think it's almost obvious why. Or I'll it. have a, a student who's comparable, 20 couple of years old, and they have a, a speech student who has a lot of behavior issues, and they can't understand why the parents aren't doing this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it seems so obvious to make these things, and they don't have their frame of reference. It's small sometimes. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, Melissa, you specifically mentioned, you know, the 85-year-old person who just, uh, was it yesterday, the day before, maybe you saw this, in the Chronicle of Higher Education, there was an article on ageism. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yeah. I thought it was really good. And it, it was, and really came out and made the case for 
thinking about ageism, the way we think about discrimination on the basis of race, gender, class, sexual orientation, etc. But adding that right in there, and people have done ableist, what's called ableist, you know, work for a while. But this was sort of a front and center. Here it is. This is why it's important. And they talked about uh, college age students because that's who we tend to talk about, right? That's that's who we interact with uh, for our professions. Uh, you know, about college age students having difficulty identifying with someone of a different age. Just it's just it's difficult for them. The the kind of cultural framework in which they were raised, even just sort of the aches and pains. You know, your average twenty year old hasn't had that many aches and pains. Now there are those who do, and of course we're not going to be ableist and you know dismiss them. But uh, you know, other than maybe that broken leg they had when they played sports in high school or something. The average 20 year old certainly JMU student doesn't have the kinds of aches and pains that you have when you're 85. Even if you're pretty, you know, doing pretty well for an 85 year old, you, it's a constant round of doctors and hospitals and you know pills and just understanding that life is can be can be a difficult move for someone who's in their early 20s. And also teaching them that they they get sympathy a lot, or they say, I don't want to get old after they work on a patient like that. You know, and right. then, like, no, that's not, you know. Right. Yeah. Feeling sorry for your patients. <laughs> but again, that's kind of standing at the top of the pit and looking down and saying, oh, that's, that's really too bad. And, and maybe that's better than not even being aware of the pit in the first place, but still, it's a, sometimes, I mean, if you've ever gotten too much sympathy, it can be uncomfortable. Not everybody always wants sympathy all the time. Sometimes too much, we want, you want empathy, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes sympathy can come across whether it is or not, can come across as a bit patronizing, mm -hmm. or you're the project, or, right? And you want to be treated as an equal human being, not as someone's project or someone's poor little, you know, charity case or something. And so, yeah, you, you, how do we get students to, to, to make, to use empathy to bridge that gap, to think what is it like, you know, to, to be that age? What is it like? to have these aches and pains? What is it like for people not to take you as seriously anymore as they did? What is it like to be essentially a 22-year-old in an 85-year-old's body? Because face it, we all stop aging somewhere in our early 20s. Our body keeps going, but our identity is still <laughs> stuck somewhere. We're all just 22-year-olds with X number of years of experience being 22, and a body that's kind of running further and further away from that with every birthday, right? But how do you see, the, I actually had a nursing student once who said, I try to see the college student and every old person that I interact with. And I thought that was a really sweet way of thinking about it because that is who they are. This is this is a person who just has you know 60 years of experience with it. But this is a person who's essentially the same as you, just the body has different things it's going through. They've had different experiences. But that connecting on that human to human level, you know, the empathy that that requires. And this ageism article was really good. Uh, the, the professor who wrote it said, I think it was a woman, starts off her class you know, what are stereotypes about the elderly? And she says she's shocked about the things she hears. You know, the way that people talk about the elderly. If you talked about any other group that way, yeah. it would be absolutely taboo, <laughs> right? I mean, you insert Jew, right? And all of a sudden, everyone gets really uncomfortable, rightly so. But the way they talk about the elderly is just is terrible. And if you look at popular media, you know, the elderly are funny. They're not quite to be taken seriously. They're often a bit... Dotty, right? They do funny things because they're so out of it. They, uh, we, we often, they're, they're a punchline often. It's, it's rare that you, you know, it's, it's not since uh, the Karate Kid in 1984 that we took an old person seriously and saw them as a source of wisdom <laughs> and someone who had something to contribute that was meaningful and, uh, and so on. Uh, so yeah, I think that's a really important point that you bring up about being able to interact with the elderly because that is an other, right? Empathy is about bridging the gap to the other. Age can be a form of, of otherness. Um, so I think that's an important point. So yeah, thank you for that. Okay, uh, Ronica, Andreas, what'd you talk about? Do you remember? I, I remember what I talked about and what you said. I was uh, sharing that for me, uh, I thought it was important to come here and learn uh, how could I teach empathy when we're discussing controversial topics of mm. Spanish law, for mm. instance, uh, mm -hmm. and how legal systems are different in the way they uh, deal with, for instance, uh, homoparental families there mm -hmm. versus here. So, uh, and we divide class the class uh, in, into groups, and uh, 
at times it's hard for me to, when I assign groups, okay, this is, you're gonna take the position of, uh, you know, you're gonna defend this point of view and you're going to be against this point of view. Some of them say, no, I wanna be on that group. <laughs> no, I wanna be, because they, they don't want to, and I say, no, you're gonna stay in that group. But that's good, because it forces them to take the viewpoint that's yeah. alien to them. I know, uh, but it's funny that at times you always have one student ending up you know, representing a group and then saying, actually, actually they are defending the other group and saying, no, remember you're supposed to be in this way. Uh, so I'm trying to find, you know, is there, are there other ways to teach, you know, how to uh, relate to others and why in other cultures, in other countries, even their system, their legal system is different based on history and religious beliefs and is there something, well, of course, we, we definitely should be, you know, putting ourselves in someone else's shoes to think why they are, uh, why they do things the way they do it and why they think the way they think. Right. I think the, the definition of empathy we saw earlier, one that's that's current and that you're free, of course, to disagree with, but I think is thought-provoking is not only being able to put yourself into the shoes of someone from another culture, from another legal system, but actually to find value in that. Even though it's odd, foreign, mm -hmm. even though it's unfamiliar, even though you may, at least initially at first blush, dismiss it out of hand, but finding some value, not that you have to agree with everyone at the same time, that's actually impossible since not everyone has the same opinions and people's opinions clash. So uh, you can't agree with everyone all the time, nor should we have to do that. I don't think tolerance or open mind demands that of us. It doesn't make any sense. But to be able to find value in that worldview, even as they still do not subscribe fully to that worldview, I think that's an important aspect of, of empathy that at least that gets discussed in the literature. I mean, one thing that I was wondering in this context was to what extent you need empathy, right? So that's one thing. Is it because empathy has an intellectual component, but also an, an emotional or um, affective component? And I'm not sure that's always needed in order to understand somebody else's perspective, but it may be helpful, right? To be able to identify with somebody and then say, oh yeah, no, I can kind of see how, how you could see things in a, um, in a way that's different from how I see things. And that's, you know, if you think about student development, that's one of those phases that they should go through going away from this perspective that there is one truth to the more relativistic truth, which obviously then leads to problems that they say, oh, it's all just opinion. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they have to develop some empathy again for themselves to find their own position. Yeah. Right, empathy for the self is something that I think is important as well. Empathy is not just about bridging the gap to the other, but sometimes, paradoxically, the self is a kind of other, right? You need to have empathy for yourself and not see yourself from this critical, removed lens, but have empathy for yourself. I think that's, that's an important uh, point as well, sure. All right, Christy, Jennifer. Well, we had some, some things in common. Christy teaches religion and I teach foreign language. And we both see empathy as, as kind of an underlying goal in our courses for students to really get to the subject. So for, in my case, um, teaching foreign language, it's also culture is part of the foreign language. And, um, and I know we, we use the word appreciation of culture. We want the students to have an appreciation of a foreign culture. But I think empathy goes much beyond the idea, yes. superficial idea of yeah. appreciating. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I love the food there. It's great. Or <laughs> what right. cool dresses they wear. It's fantastic. Uh, right. um, so I think empathy really gets to that point where we secretly hope, I know I secretly hope my students have the experience of, of living in another culture and, and, and being a different person and actually changing and, mm -hmm. and seeing everything differently from then on, seeing their own culture differently still going through that transformative process. Um, also, I think it's desirable here at JMU because it does fit the mission of, of JMU students being global citizens, I think is the word. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, because again, with foreign languages. Citizens. Enlightened yeah. and engaged. Enlightened, Enlightened and engaged citizens. Engaged, mm -hmm. uh, because it, it, how could you do that if you were not able to open yourself to seeing um, right. different perspectives? That's, that's one of the defining characteristics of enlightenment, right? That comes out of the 18th century is the ability to understand, to interact in a meaningful way with the other without just trying to destroy the other or sub subjugate the other, but actually seeing what value there might be and, and, and what the other has to say. That was one of the big yeah. contributions, right, of yeah. the Enlightenment in the 18th century. 
And lastly, I just mentioned, I kind of, I think in my mind, I'm confounding empathy with almost um, critical thinking skills, because I feel like for critical thinking, you, you almost have to see other perspectives. And so to me, I, I think, I, in my head, I must be thinking of emp empathetic, or whatever that. Yeah, empathic thinking. Yes, yeah. it kind of as the same as critical thinking. So not only to use different sources to compare situation, but also different perspectives. And I think they need empathy to be able to really have that skill, which you say we focus on critical thinking, but we don't talk about any other types of to take right. that perspective. To focus right. On. Well, I mean, I certainly agree with you. I think empathic it requires critical thinking to think empathically. Uh, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I think that's right. I think there's a lot of overlap there. It's hard to do one without the other. Christy, yeah. I think Jennifer summarized it really well. Okay. <laughs> Great. Good job, Jennifer. Then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Susan and Aram, what do you have for us? Uh, and then this, I mean, this, this question of dismantling stereotypes. Uh, not always successful. I mean, I don't try to press anything. But also to espouse diversity. Uh, because even individuals that come from a particular culture, they only um, have encountered or they're familiar with one aspect and not all <coughs> aspects. Right. But again, even you, you know, even they might not accept the diversity in their own culture and might try to. Yeah. So, stereotypes and diversity. Stereotypes and diversity. Okay, good. Susan, do you have anything to add? Um, um, this is a fantastic topic you have given us. So, Thank I you. am from the School of Education. So, just now you told me why mm -hmm. my teaching empathy be described. I think in my class, I teach pedagogy. Um, mm -hmm. So sometimes I, I told my students, um, you should be better to be a teacher here and to think how and you teach and what you want to teach. Then because some of the students will always say, um, oh, the teacher is bad. <laughs> so, so, so we can change their role so they can, to, they can feel what the teacher to be is very, mm. <laughs> it's very, um, Sorry, I don't know how to say. Teacher is full. Maybe teacher is full of love, patience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if they change the rules in my class, they can, um, they can memorize. Uh, they can uh, know how to be a good teacher. Then sometimes in um, I will teach something about the um, the family education about the parents and the children. So uh, sometimes I will take them to be some uh, little food. food. A little play mm -hmm. to be parents or to be teachers or write some letters to the pet to their parents or to their future son future daughters just like that mm -hmm. so, to yeah. put them in the role of the parent yeah so they can try to empathize with what a parent is thinking yeah just as you try to have an empathize with what teachers think because you're preparing teachers yeah so you're trying to get them to think not just the teacher is bad but to think well what if i was a teaching what if i was in front of the class. It's one thing I love to do with my students. If I ever sense that my students are getting a little bit annoyed or something, I'll try something different. I'll say, okay, uh, you annoyed person, uh, <laughs> you have 10 minutes of the, of the class lesson next time. We're gonna be working on this, it's on the reading. I want you to talk about the reading. It'll be all you teach it any way you want. You've got 10 minutes and they're up there and they struggle and it's hard. And, uh, yeah. Why is everybody yawning? And yeah, yeah. Three people were looking out the window, but I was talking and all of a sudden there's just all this respect yeah. for what I'm trying to do as a teacher, right? Because they've, they've been through it. They're not just passively watching something, expecting it to be perfect, but yeah. they understand the struggles. So you can role, and you talked about role playing too. You're playing the role of a parent, yeah. playing the role of a teacher. Uh, role playing can be an important way of trying to put yourself in the mindset of the other. That's, that's great. Um, I like this quote by Thoreau. Could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes for an instant? Yes. Right? I mean, it is miraculous. To be able to actually see, I mean, really see and feel what the other person is. Whoa. The instant. <laughs> Have empathy, Peter. <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> Could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes, for instance? It's a magical thing when you're able to really see, or when someone else really sees you. I think that's 
and the, the connection that happens because of that, the synergies that come out of that, and the ability to help that person or them to help you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a magical thing. Certainly, I think in family life, that can be very, very important. The spouse or children, uh, the ability to actually get it. My wife is telling me something and all of a sudden, oh wait, I, oh I get it now, oh okay, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, it can be a, a, magical, uh, a magical thing. I have a few more slides. I want to talk about the importance of empathy, why some people say empathy is particularly important in this moment in our country. I mean, we could talk about Charlottesville, we could talk about the rise of neo-Nazism, we could talk about the way the history is interpreted and different folks interpreting history different ways. That'd be really very relevant to us right here in Harrisonburg right now today. We could talk about the increasing uh, sort of tribalism that you're seeing, certainly around the world, but even the United States, where people are identifying with various things and uh, that's who they identify with and all the other tribes and groups are, are wrong or bad somehow. Um, technology seems to be furthering this too. You know, I remember when the internet came out, and everyone was like, this is great. Every <laughs> hick in some village somewhere is going to have access to the best and, and thoughts, you know, that are out there. And this is going to bring enlightenment, and people are going to agree more on what the facts are, and people are going to be able to look things up, and no more, you know, decisions being made based on ignorance, because all the knowledge will be there. And I think that has fairly... You know, to be fair, happened in many cases. I think we've seen a lot of people uh, get educations and learn all kinds of things. And the internet has certainly helped me with that, to gain information and have a better understanding of the world in myriad ways. It's helped my teaching. Uh, but it's also, we've also, of course, seen the opposite effect, which is people, it's made the world much, much more narrow, where people, you can go online and only read the news sites that back up what you think. You can only watch the YouTube channels that align with your interests. You can only listen to the music, only come across the music that you already know you like. You know, the, the idea of exposure to something new, which the internet could provide if we use it that way, often it, it doesn't do that for folks, depending on the choices you make. And so, uh, thank you. So, so social media can have the tendency of actually making us less empathetic because we become even more deeply ensconced in our own interests, our own viewpoints, our own identities, however, you know, however we line up tribally, you know, whatever identity markers we line up with. And so the ability to actually be able to see things through another person, to, to break through all of that, I think is remarkable. Okay, so the importance of empathy. See, he's holding an umbrella, that's nice. Uh, Sarah Conrath at the University of Michigan has been done really interesting work. Uh, she's been looking at empathy tests that have been given to college freshmen since 1979, they're still giving them. I don't know where, if it's at Michigan or not, but she's looking at these, and guess what? Pretty much, virtually every year, the empathy levels of college freshmen, and they give it, I think, right at the beginning, like in late August, right before they start classes, that's always when we test them the most. Whenever we're trying to get research data, it's always, you know, right in the first week of classes that we hit them with stuff. Jamie does that too. Um, but it's basically gone down virtually every year since 1979. It continues to go down. The trends are not good. And then even more interesting to me anyway is Gene Twenge at San Diego State and Foster at University of South Alabama. I can't remember his first name. But they've been uh, giving the narcissistic personality inventory to college freshmen uh, various places throughout the country, not just one university, since 1982. And Every year, the, the level of narcissism, the average level of narcissism among incoming college freshmen has risen since 1982, virtually. There may have been a year or two that was off, but I mean, the trend is it's, it's just like that. And in the most recent iteration of this inventory, a full 70% of incoming college freshmen scored above average on the narcissistic personality inventory. So 70% were above average in narcissism. So I guess there's an average level of narcissism that's just part of human nature. We like ourselves to some degree. But 70%, that's a, majority, a strong majority, that scored above average. And the, the test, you know, it asks you questions, then you rate it on a scale from one to five. I think it is, you know, five, you know, strongly agree, you know, somewhat agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree, whatever it was. And the questions were things like, I like to look at myself in the mirror. And then, you know, one to five. Or here's one that was really interesting, I thought, the world would be a better place if more people were like me. That's one of the questions, too. And you can, you know, 
The world, for the record, if it was more like me, would be an absolute disaster. <laughs> you have a bunch of people giving lectures on empathy, and like there'd be no roads, and cars would break down, just stay break down, broken down, and the government wouldn't run because I know nothing about that, and the economy would be in trouble because I don't know anything about that, and sick people wouldn't get better because you know I haven't progressed much beyond giving children Tylenol. So. Um, no, it'd be terrible. But increasingly, college students, yes, of course, yeah, of course. And so you're seeing this, yeah. Is this just American college students? Or this is only American okay. college students. You can find it online. If you just do a Google search for narcissistic personality inventory, you can take it, too, to see how narcissistic you are, uh, or aren't, um, and how you, how you score, uh, which, is, which I think is really interesting. Like I said, um, there are a number of reasons for this. We'll get into, uh, in a second, at least a number of reasons that have been proposed by very reasonable people. Um, but I think technology does play a role. Yeah. I, I'd like to know the after. So college is the treatment. How do they score okay. after? Hmm. Right. Like at the end of their senior year or something. Right. Have they become more empathetic, more open-minded to other views, more tolerant, uh, things like that? <clears throat> I'd be interested also in seeing how narcissistic they think they are. <laughs> so they might come in not realizing how narcissistic they are, and then they leave maybe thinking they're more narcissistic than they actually are, maybe it's in verses, where they become so aware of all of these new concepts that they think, you know what, I'm not as, and then they, they underplay it maybe. Yeah, I'd also, also that, that they would be more empathetic, yeah. they exposed <laughs> to more people, their, I, their assumptions are challenged, that, that, that's what I would hope. Right. You want college to do all of those things, right? I mean, that's what we see ourselves as doing. I've always thought that was an important part of teaching college, uh, teaching students, is to, it's not just cramming facts, right? But it's helping them to see with new eyes, right? It's helping them to think critically and think of others. You had your hand up, Christy. Oh, I don't think I did. I think just asking the American oh, thing. Or maybe I hope my- Oh, okay, maybe that was early, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, having flashbacks. So I'd be surprised if this were if this were kind of a global study, I'd be interested to see how that varied. But it probably would vary by country. Yeah, I mean, there, there's one study. You know, they've done a number of math studies where they have our AP calculus high school students take a calculus exam. It's the same exam administered in various different countries, and they administer the exam. How well do you think you did? And American students far overshoot how well they actually did. But then they looked at Japanese and South Korean students who had taken an equivalent calculus class, like our AP classes, and they gave them, and this was only the top 2% in both countries. They didn't let anyone sort of, they controlled for, okay, the top 2% students, two of students in America, the top 2 students in South Korea and Japan, they said, how well did you do? And it was the exact same exam, and they're all, oh, I didn't know so well, I, I don't think I, and they all scored phenomenally high. So outcomes certainly isn't necessarily related to how well you think you did. Confidence and outcome are very different things. Which is another issue that I, I want to get to a little bit later, but since we're on it, um, you know, where does that come from? Where, where does this come from that uh, American college calculus, American AP calculus high school students would think so highly of their abilities? Right? Where does it, they would overshoot it so far? Where does that come from? And that sort of uh, self-confidence, which is maybe that's not quite the right word, uh, doesn't that link then to, or map onto empathy in some significant way, or the lack thereof, that you think so highly of yourself, that maybe it gives you a greater tendency not to consider other people as much? Yeah. I'd also like to see comparisons to other groups, right? Because um, Twenge or whatever, yeah, pronunciations, and Foster seem to focus on students, right? And I don't think faculty are the masters of empathy and like narcissism. So I don't know what's going on there. Is this age, is this generation, or is it social economic status, or is it simply, you know, I don't know. I think that would be good to look at. Uh, I mean, so many st I mean, studies disproportionately involve college students because they're disproportionately done by college professors who have disproportionate free access to large numbers of college students. Right? It's, a lot, it's a lot more difficult to get you know people to compare to 40 year olds compared to 60 year olds compared to different generations compared to people who aren't in college who don't go to college compared to people who maybe have phds compared you know looking at education background income uh, i think that would be interesting it would give us more of a textured 
textured view. Uh, you know, is this a social problem in general? Are all of us becoming narcissistic? And is it a problem? Is it is, is it is it a yeah? Is it a, is it a problem? I mean, if the world would be like me, it was would be great. <laughs> 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 that would, that's right. That, everything would be wonderful. Steve Duck at the University of Iowa. This talks about social isolation. I think ties into technology a bit, which has a tendency to isolate people socially. Or there's that book Alone Together, right? That talked about the phenomenon of how we're always together but alone because we're on our screens you know the the family dinner where they're all sitting there at the table but they're all on their phone so are they really together i mean they may be physically in the same room but are they really interacting in any meaningful way with others so steve duck at iowa he found his research found that socially isolated as compared with integrated individuals evaluate others less generously after interacting with them so people who are socially isolated are more likely to evaluate others less generously be more, a little more harsh in their judgments of others when they're not as connected. So that disconnection can lead to uh, a lack of empathy. And then Kenneth Rotenberg in England at Keele University found something very similar. His research shows that lonely people, so that's different from socially isolated, but you know enough overlap <coughs> for me to put them on the same PowerPoint slide. Lonely people are more likely to take advantage of others' trust to cheat them in laboratory games. So lonely people are more likely to take advantage of others because they don't feel as connected. So less empathy as you are more removed from other people, which is really interesting as well. Okay, uh, and then there's a topic I'm very interested in because I teach foreign languages, I teach literature in foreign languages. <coughs> empathy and reading. So Ray McMahr at York University <coughs> in Toronto found, well, it's not a strong, it's his conclusion, but he, he says perhaps, He's, there's evidence to indicate. He, he doesn't come out and say it strongly. He says a decline in reading is perhaps linked to a decline in empathy. The idea behind reading, particularly novels, right, for centuries has been as you read novels, sure, these are fictitious people who never existed, but as you get into the mind of a character, particularly a protagonist or someone close to the protagonist, you enter another world and you enter another person's mind and heart and you learn how to think like they think and why they make the decisions they do, and it leads to greater empathy. Which, of course, is paradoxical because reading for the last five, six hundred years has been largely an individual private activity that you don't do communally with others the way they did in the Middle Ages and earlier. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting paradox or irony there. But uh, the decline in reading does seem to link, uh, be linked to decline in empathy. There's a wonderful book called Empathy in the Novel. It's by Suzanne Keene, who's at Washington and Lee. Uh, I don't know her, but I know people who know her, and everybody says she's really nice and very empathetic, actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, she uh, examines the research that we have, and there's quite a bit of it out there, on you know, uh, the idea that novel reading in particular leads to people being more empathetic and making more empathetic decisions because you enter into those characters, especially when you enter into the minds of characters who are different from you. So I teach French, so automatically, these are French people writing these books. When my students read them, they're not French for the most part. There already is that other that they're encountering. If the, if the writer is a different gender than they are, then that only adds to the otherness. If they're writing in a different time period, as they often are, then that also adds to empathy. Because now you're empathizing with people from a completely different time and a completely different worldview in many respects. Uh, you know, the, 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 the empathy that can be created as you read a novel, uh, can, a novel can introduce you to all kinds of different others, and that can create empathy for a wide variety of others. And so uh, I think that's important, and she, she makes that point. What is interesting is she brings up a study that was done, I think it was her who brought this up, in England. They had school children read Harry Potter particularly parts of Harry Potter where there are social distinctions between, what is it, muggles, mugbloods, that's the derisive term, right? And people who were born wizards, right? And, and that clearly is J.K. Rowling making a commentary on sort of a kind of stratified British class system, right? She wrote, her first book for adults was all about the class system. I remember reading a review and they said, who knew she has all these ideas about social class and Britain and it's so interesting and so fascinating. I thought, that stuff's all over Harry Potter. What are you talking about? Uh, it's an absolute critique of the British class system. But they had kids read these passages where certain children at Hogwarts would be made fun of because they don't have the same lineage as others. And then they gave them an empathy test afterwards. And then they had a control group that hadn't read the Harry Potter. And it turned out that their empathy scores were pretty much the same. 
And so that kind of flies in the face of this idea. However, they added in a third group where they had them read the empathy passages, the, the, the passages that should elicit empathy from the reader in terms of social class and stratification. And then afterwards, they had a 30-minute discussion about how we treat people who have more or less opportunities than us. And then they gave them the empathy test, and then they scored a lot higher. So the idea was, it's not just reading, it's also having the opportunity to discuss the reading that helps to create empathy. And that's what we can do in our classrooms. Because we don't just assign things to read, we also go over them. Uh, and I thought that was an interesting point uh, to, be, to be made. Yeah. Can I add a comment? So one, one of my colleagues um, teaches his entire world religions class through novels. So I will oh. tell him that he's on this something. Right on the, right <laughs> on the sure mark. He knows that already. <laughs> but that's been tempting me as well. That's interesting. Uh, that's very interesting. So, like, Siddhartha and... Yeah. Okay. Uh, interesting. Um, so, yeah, the, and the decline... Re the, the National Endowment for the Arts did a study back when Dana Joya was the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts from 2003 to 2006, I think, where they, uh, they looked at reading in America, particularly the reading of uh, what he called fiction. So they were counting, they weren't just looking at literature, you know, masterpiece theater kind of stuff. They were looking at you know, anything, if you're reading Tom Clancy, you're reading literature, we're just gonna count all fiction as literature. And they of course noted a decline in reading among all age groups, especially the under 30 age group. And what they found was across every demographic they looked at, race, income, education, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, age, I mean, anything you could look at, they didn't look at sexual orientation, but pretty much anything you could look at, they looked at it and found that uh, as reading among that demographic declined, so did certain civic behaviors that are seen as essential to the survival of a democracy. So voting participation goes down. Participation in political parties, in civic groups, League of Women Voters, you know, uh, the Lions Club, you know, whatever it is, civic participation on which democracy ostensibly depends to some significant extent, um, also went down. And he said it was remarkable because it didn't map with uh, income, social status, uh, education. I think they even looked at like education of the reader's parents as well. Um, none of that, so it mapped most nearly by far onto were you a reader or not? And such that a high school dropout, they found that a, the average American high school dropout who was a regular reader of fiction, fiction even being somewhat loosely defined, still was a more active civic participant by a factor of two than the average college graduate who didn't read fiction regularly. That's how strong the, and I actually met him at a conference one time, and I ran up to him and I said, but correlation isn't causation, and how can you know it? And he said, yes, that's true, absolutely, you're absolutely right, correlation isn't causation. He made a really good point. He said, but correlation is correlation. <laughs> it doesn't mean there's nothing there, he said. And it's across, it's so striking, and across every demographic, that there's something there, and it was worth putting the report out and talking about it. Even though correlation isn't causation, the, the correlation was so strong that something's going on that's worth talking about, and so we put the report out there. So that's something to think about too. Uh, arts participation goes up as reading goes up. Even attendance at uh, sports events goes up with reading and down with the decline of reading. Again, you're with other people, you're, you're connecting together with them, you're, you're cheering on your team, you're talking to people, you're interacting, you're out and about with people. Those are civic behaviors, those are behaviors that can lead to empathy. Because we saw what happens to lonely people, the people who watch the game at home like I normally do, who just watch it on the TV, um, you know, they, they, they tend to be less empathetic. But the people who go out, they're among the people, they're more civically active, they read more. So I thought that was interesting. And I really like this quote by Kafka. I have it on my office door, actually. A book must be the axe for the frozen sea within us. I mean, that's, that's been the... I'm in literature, so I'm going to be biased in favor of literary arguments here, but... That's always been one of the main justifications for studying literature, is that you read something and it chips away at the ice inside of us. It, it warms us up uh, to other people. And so that's, that's an argument that's been around for a long time. We now have uh, neuroscience to back up these. See, in humanity, we come up with ideas, but we never really test them. We just say they're good because they sound right and they seem to make sense. 
But we now have neuroscience to back us up on this. Neuroscience shows that many studies in neuroscience show that um, when people are reading a novel, the same areas of the brain get activated, light up in color, as when they are engaging in some empathic activity. It's the same, it's the same regions. So neurologically, you know, we have a basis for these ideas that we've had for a long time. So just trust us when we say something in humanities. The science will catch up to us eventually. <laughs> yeah, then participation trophies, right? If everyone's getting participation trophies, everyone's special, so that can maybe feed the narcissism that you're special, even though you haven't actually accomplished anything meaningful other than you showed up and tried to kick a ball. Right. And uh, you, get a, you get a participation trophy uh, for that. That says 99% fool's gold. Is what it says there. So, right. And participation trophies have been blamed for this rise in narcissism. The self-esteem movement has been blamed for the rise in narcissism. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. But I'm just I'm bringing these things up for, for, uh, for thinking. I've been doing a bit of talking, comments, thoughts that are that are generating as we're talking about these issues. Anyone want to push back? Anyone want to nuance any of this? Add some texture. I think it's it, empathy hits a lot of other <coughs> concepts, and we were talking about the eight key questions. Right. And fairness is one I hear a lot now. Like fairness has somehow become, and I blame Trump for this and everything else, but um, it's a synonym for I don't like it. You know, it's not fair how the you know, Paris Street, not fair. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that uh, inability, if you're only seeing it from your perspective, something might not seem fair. Not fair for it's, me. Right, it's not fair for me to have to pay for somebody else's health care. Right, right. You know, versus, wow, if I'm sick and I need health care, <laughs> what's right. fair now? Right. And so I think it. I think empathy is really hitting a lot of the, the other um, ethical principles or other questions that we have to look at. Yeah, it bumps up against so many other things. It doesn't exist in isolation, mm -hmm. right? Which only makes the arguments for why, why it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was wondering, I don't know if you know this, whether empathy is universal, either as a concept or as some, something that exists, or whether it's contingent to certain cultures or Right? Is it basically a Western European and American idea right. that we work with, but it's not present somewhere else, or is it universal? Right. Uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, all I could say about that is that even within the Western world, not everyone agrees on the definition of what empathy is. I mean, it came around 100 years ago as a, as a, a way to describe being able to understand uh, a work of art or, or some cultural production. Right. That's not really, there's just overlap with literature a little bit, but that's not really what we think of today when we think of empathy. So even within the West, there are different definitions. Some people say it's walking in another person's shoes. Some people, some people say, well, it's just standing at the pit and feeling sorrow. Some people say, well, you have to be in the pit. Some people say, well, you have to be in the pit and you have to see what's good about being in the pit. You have to find something that's good about it. <laughs> uh, you know, like with the Israeli film and the Palestinian, you, know, you have to find, find value. So even... Even we in the West can't always agree on what empathy is. So if we add in the rest of the world, I hate putting it that way, but if we add in uh, you know, that, that vast expanse of the important part of the world that's not the West, uh, they must have very different notions as well if we can't even agree. And that's all I can. Yes. That doesn't entirely answer your question. That's the best, that's the best I got. Well, you have empathy for my abilities. I know part of that, um, I know theory of mind is, is Another definition would be that cognitive behaviorists would use for empathy, which is developed, you know, at the toddler age, um, and is basically what defines human to distinguish us from other animals in many ways. So the development of theory of mind is basically the idea, um, the ability for an individual to to recognize other people as individuals with different needs and desires and wants as yourself. And so it, it happens, you know, as babies grow. It's it's kind of a point when the when the young toddler realizes, like, oh, okay, yeah, this is, mommy wants something different than what I want, and they don't notice the difference and stuff. Um, so it, it, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I wouldn't think that it doesn't exist, but like Peter said, it could be recognized in different terms, but I mean, it has to exist with humans. It is something that um, the lack of empathy for aut on the autism spectrum can, right. is one of the, the factors that determine if autism is less. Right, right. Less ability to empathize. So I know that it's, it's part of our biology, basically, of our normal development. Um, 
right, yeah. how it's described and defined, or if it's taught or made explicit. And I think that culturally is variable, but I wouldn't think that it would vary across many species, except in cases of, you know, taught taught to very different relevance. And what you're saying makes you think too. About no, mm -hmm. the, 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 yeah, theory of mind I think is very helpful because it is one of sort of our defining how we define ourselves as human beings is that we have yeah. this thing that we call empathy and we have different definitions, mm -hmm. but it's, it's it's a workable enough term that we we are at least somewhat on the same page, and so if that's what makes us human, then that must be universal whether you're in the West or not. Yeah. Um, but what you said made me think of something else, which ties into some of the other definitions of empathy that you guys have brought up today which is sociopaths. Mm -hmm. Sociopaths yes. are often very, very gifted mm -hmm. at being able to tell what a person is feeling, what they mm -hmm. want, what their needs are, because they mm -hmm. respond to those, and that's how they get power over them and yeah. end up using them. But what the step they lack mm -hmm. is actually caring about it, actually using that knowledge and that ability to connect for good. They use it for, for evil, right? That's so the, the ability to put yourself in another person's shoes maybe isn't really full empathy because any socio sociopath can do that, right? It's putting yourself in their shoes and then behaving in such a way that uh, helps the person based on the circumstances that you now understand mm -hmm. because you place yourself in their shoes. Uh, I think that's an, that's an important point too that I was, I was thinking of as you were saying that. Yeah. Some um, neurodiverse scholars have pushed back against that concept, though, I mean, mm. if being if empathy is what defines us as being human, then what about people on the spectrum mm -hmm. or people with psychological disabilities that don't have that? So are they human? Yeah. So it, it does like bring up some really tough questions, uh, right? Yeah. Or or, or are certain people... animals more human than some humans? And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I can see that. Or, or people whose life circumstances have been such that it has been difficult for them to develop empathy because of how they were treated, you know, growing up or early on in their childhood or. Mm -hmm trauma or war or something like that, things that they're perfectly innocent in but just never had the chance to develop in the same way. And who's comfortable calling themselves human, right? Uh, yeah, I, that's, a, that's a good point. Okay, uh, Bloom's taxonomy I think we're all familiar with, right? Uh, the easiest is at the bottom, the hardest is at the top. When you're learning something, the easiest thing to do is just to remember it. Just remember what you were told. Next level up is remember it, but also understand what the thing actually is. You're not just memorizing things and spitting them back like a parrot, but you actually understand what you're saying. And then applying. Can you take that knowledge and apply it to a different context that shows that you're able to apply? And then analyze. Can you look at the thing that you've, that you've remembered, understood, and applied, and can you analyze it? What, is it? what does it suggest? Where will it lead? How does it link in with these other things? Then you have evaluating, is this thing good, is this thing bad, is it useful, is it helpful, um, how should I feel about this thing, and then ultimately create it. Can you create it yourself, right? Can you actually you know, write the novel? Can you build the bridge? Can you create the robot? Can you create the program? Can you, you know, whatever, make the painting or whatever it is? I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. That's a basic taxonomy that I bring up just because I want to contrast it to two taxonomies. Okay, the first taxonomy, uh, and that's what they, where this circle is from, uh, is from Fink, many of you are probably familiar with, right? Creating Significant Learning Experiences. This is a really helpful book in uh, creating a course, creating a syllabus, uh, designing, it's a lot of course design. Uh, it's a standard in the field of course design. So Fink doesn't have Bloom's taxonomy. There's some overlap, but you have these six areas of what he calls the taxonomy of significant learning. So you have learning how to learn, you have foundational knowledge, basic stuff you have to know, application, how do you apply this knowledge, integration, how does it connect to other things you know. And then there are the two that I really want to focus on. One of you mentioned the word caring earlier. I love what I love about Fink is he has a whole section in his taxonomy of just caring. Right? Just caring. Developing new feelings. Not just taking the feelings you have and making them broader or bigger or, or more wonderful, but actually creating new feelings. Becoming, the take the change of heart earlier, that sort of, it's almost like a conversion experience, right? Uh, feelings, interests, new values, right? These things are fundamental to who we are. And then they, they have something called, think has something called human dimension, which is learning about the self and learning about the other, which also involves an empathic move towards yourself, but also towards the other. Uh, so that's a model 
for, uh, for empathic thinking that I want to talk about. So think, like I said, human dimension and caring are the two I want to focus on because they seem to have the most rapport with, um, with empathy. Under the human dimension, Fink talks about learning about others, very basic, service learning, okay? Um, engaging in service in a meaningful way, not in a patronizing way, not in I do my two hours of tutoring at the Boys and Girls Club and I'm a good person, check, you know, but becoming somebody who is engaged in serving, serving others. I remember when I was in college at UVA, they had this thing called Madison House, it's, it's fantastic, it's this house and they have, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000 volunteers every year who just sign up to volunteer in the community. And it's great, you have all this youthful idealism and energy and time that goes into it. The university you know, funds it and has those resources and they do a lot of good in the community and I respect Madison House and I hope it continues forever. But to me, there's a difference between the Madison House volunteer who goes, does their six hours a week, comes home to their roommate who's having a hard time, doesn't pick up on it or doesn't care to, or to and then moves on with their life. To me, there's, there's something missing, you know? That's a checkbox mentality versus the person who does the mass and house stuff. It changes them in some way, this service learning, and then they come home and then they're more keen to what their roommate is going through because of the service learning that they've actually done, right? Uh, so I think that's something, it's sympathy versus empathy, pity versus empathy, uh, I think that's important. Interestingly, Fink talks about a broader concept of the other, so uh, you brought up animals, uh, concept, uh, the other not just as racially different from us or in a different time period or a different kind of person, but actually concept, the animal as other, uh, the environment as other. Uh, even they talked about structures or institutions as the other processes as the other, and developing empathy for non-human, even non-living, in the organic sense, things. Having empathy for those things. So that's an interesting thing, too. And then they just define empathy as awareness. I say they, it's fake. Fake defines as awareness of others' feelings, needs, and concerns. Again, I think we've agreed that you want to go a little bit further than that, not just an sociopath's awareness, but the ability to, to step in and do something about it, the desire to. And then under caring, he says a lot of things. And I do have handouts. If you're interested in learning more about Fink and then the second taxonomy I'm going to talk about, I have some handouts here. I don't think I have quite enough for everyone. But uh, I can give you those afterwards. Caring. The others they encounter in the class or the study. Students may find that people different from themselves in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, religion, nationality, or whatever, are good people. And that the process of understanding and interacting with them can be an exciting and enriching experience. So we're kind of beyond tolerance here. We're kind of beyond, you do your thing, I'll do mine. Um, there's a separation implied in that. But actually finding that encounter with the other to be exciting and to be enriching, that you can gain something from it. It's not just you're, you're having pity because it's the right thing to do, or you're reaching out because that's what you should do, but you actually find it exciting and enrich enriches you uh, as well. That, that you look forward to finding new ways of looking at the world or new values to have. I think that's, a, that's an important part. Now, of course, there are limits here, too. Um, I think of the Peace Corps, for example, which the way that President Kennedy envisioned it, I think, is great. I think in there are cases in which it works great. But I'm, unfortunately, a Peace Corps cynic. Uh, I remember reading uh, a piece, an op-ed in the New York Times, must have been about 10 years ago, it was a former Peace Corps director for East Africa. And he was talking about all this great youthful idealism. People sign up for the Peace Corps to go, they're going to help, they're going to make a difference. The world is in trouble and they're going to do their part at least for two and a half, three years to do something about it. And he said that the East Africa region was sent to the head Peace Corps officer or whatever. He, he got the thing, you know, the top 15 things that they needed. And near the top of the list, it was agricultural innovation the ability to create meaningful irrigation systems, um, increasing crop yield, right? getting us some food, that medicine was a bit further down. The very last thing on the list was learning English. right? But what does almost every Peace Corps volunteer who goes to East Africa do? They go there and they teach the local children English. right? Uh, that's what he was saying. And, uh, and so you have the, the youthful idealism, you have the desire to go and help, but it's like you want to help on your terms, right? Empathy is not just 
me trying to do what I think is good, but it's looking at what the other actually needs and filling that hole, regardless of what your instincts might be, right? So um, interacting with them can be an exciting and enriching experience, makes me think of the Peace Corps, because so often now when you see, you see it around campus here too, you see the advertisements for the Peace Corps, often it's have the experience of a lifetime, right? Um, change for good. Right? You'll never be the same again. It's all about you, 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 you. What about the kids that you're supposed to be helping? Or what about the latrines you're supposed to be digging? Or what about the diseases you're supposed to be pushing back against? Or the water you're supposed to be cleaning? Or, right? it's, it's not about them. It's about you, 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 you. And you even see the photos, and, and, they, and maybe I'm a bit far in this, but they bother me when you have like the white 20-something kid surrounded by, you know, on each side, eight African children on each side, he or she is in the center of the photo, is clearly the, the central image of the photo. I would much rather see, you know, the image of a white kid building a well with a shovel in hand or something. And you see those two, to be fair. But uh, there can be limits to, if you're just having empathy because it's exciting and enriching to you, then that maybe diminishes the empathy, that, that problematizes the empathy. So I think that um, your example of the Peace Corps was very interesting when we're talking about a more narcissistic culture, it sounds like now, yeah. possibly. Um, I wonder if the advertisements for Peace Corps 40 years ago were more of a what can you give? That would be an interesting, yeah, that'd be an interesting study. What can you give? Right. Versus, you know, have the greatest you experience of your life. That, yeah. yeah, that would be an interesting study. Just looking at the rhetoric, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, at least how young people are perceived, you know, what, what people, what the government, what the Peace Corps thinks young people want to hear what would be compelling. But it's that way in commercials too, right? I mean, commercials increasingly talk to you directly, right? You want this, you want that, you. It's not just about, you want, this product is great because it's cheap, or this product is great because it'll do all these amazing things, or this product is great because it's beautiful, look at this beautiful product. It's like, you will be this if you buy this, or it's always focused on, it's very Dale Carnegie, who always, always talk to people, you, you, you. Okay, we are starting to run out of time. Here's the second uh, taxonomy, just very quickly, of, uh, of teaching empathy. And this is uh, Wiggins and Mitaihi Understanding by Design. Uh, there may be copies of it actually here in the CFI, I'm not sure. But it talks about a bunch of different things. And empathy is one of these six facets of understanding that they talk about. They say when you design a course, try to hit these six areas. And they describe all these areas in depth in each of their chapters. But they have a whole section devoted to empathy, which they define here simply as the ability to see things from other points of view. So uh, this is the second taxonomy now. We're out of think. We're with uh, uh, Wiggins and McTighe. Empathy is a way to insight. Students have to learn how to open-mindedly embrace ideas, experiences, and texts. See, embracing. That's different from just comprehending or understanding. Actually embracing it and texts that might seem strange, off-putting, or just difficult to access. If they are to understand them, their value, and their connection to what is more familiar. So again, not just tolerating the difference, but actually uh, finding value in it, embracing, embracing it. Not that everything should be embraced, but uh, certainly we can embrace more than we do. And I like this from Stephen Jay Gould, uh, it's a paraphrase, but if we laugh at the origin of the theories of our predecessors, we will fail in our understanding of their world. So often I teach things that are old, because anything pre-1996 is old, right? So I find myself <laughs> teaching a lot of things. If they were alive when it happened, then it's old. So I teach a lot of things that are old. So I'll read literature from the 1700s. And the worldview is so different that often my students just dismiss it as out of hand. Well, that's racist, so I'm not ever taking Voltaire seriously again, right? And you have to kind of... And it's tricky because I don't want them to see to, to, to see how a racist thinks and then adopt racism as a value, but I want them to see Voltaire's world, see where he's coming from, and empathize with someone, again, carefully without actually having them, you know, adopt some of these ideologies that we find distasteful uh, nowadays, but to understand his world and where he's coming from so they don't just dismiss everything old as out of hand. I've had students who said, oh, Shakespeare, he's just sexist, racist, he's an anti-Semite, I just, I can't read that guy, it's so horrible, right? And he is all of those things. I mean, you know, Merchant of Venice, Othello, you know, Taming of the Shrew, I mean, you've got your trifecta right there. And uh, sure, but 
understand the time period, understand what the other contributions are, um, and not just dismiss things that are out of hand. To me, that's not a meaningful encounter with the other. That's just dismissing things out of hand because they're old. Mm -hmm. Peter, to yeah. me, that's, that, that's, that's technical school learning. You know, it's like not embracing new ideas, just keep tell me what I need to do to be an accountant. Uh, don't give me that liberal arts. Yeah. Right. Right. This is on the liberal. I, 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 I teach a lot of first year students, and they are they, partly because they're coming from that SOL standards of learning, just tell me what I need to know to pass the test, but they don't want to engage with. Mm -hmm. or challenge their assumptions, both yeah. the mom and dad, these are my values, and I understand that, but that's, in a way, frustrating, but it's also, it gives you the opportunity, to like, okay, but this is college, and general education, why you think, uh, also gives you that opportunity to embrace new ideas, and also learn what has happened in the past. Right, yeah. It does give us a, a field white ready to harvest, right? I mean, it's this white field and a freshman in a gen ed class, you know, and you've got these minds that you can, you've got a lot of work that you can, you can do. It's kind of a great opportunity for us. I mean, at the same time, I'm happy if a student goes through the process of thinking, rethinking previous assumptions. They go through the process, they compare it to everything else, and at the end, sometimes they're like, you know what? I do like what I originally thought, but now I know more why, or now it's more deeply rooted, or now I can sit, it's not just because I'm going along with how I was raised or, or whatever it might be, whatever narratives the culture has imposed on me and I was too passive to do anything about it, at least now they have agency to choose it. And to me that's fine if they end up that way. In fact, I hope that my students end up a combination of believing even more strongly in some things after having gone through the critical thinking process and having changed some things entirely. That, that's what I like to see, is people who have convictions uh, that are based on something meaningful and on a thought process that's meaningful, yeah, but you're right, that is, uh, that is college. Uh, empathy is a change of heart, quickly. Understanding in the interpersonal sense suggests not merely an intellectual change of mind, but a significant change of heart. You don't just see things their way intellectually, but you actually meaningfully are able to reach out. Empathy requires respect for people from, different from ourselves. Our respect for them causes us to be open-minded, to carefully consider their views when those views are different from ours. And then, quickly, if you could just think of an activity that maybe you've done or that you would like to do, just a brief sketch, uh, that could be an empathy-based learning activity or an empathic thinking activity. Here are some actual real-life examples. So from the British, things from the A-levels, national exam, Romeo and Juliet, Act 4. Imagine you're a Juliet. So if you're a 17-year-old boy, that's an even better right because you're crossing write your thoughts and feelings explaining why you have to take this desperate action it's a little bit morbid because you're doing an apologia for suicide <laughs> makes me a little uncomfortable in France a few years ago there was the the fourth grade teacher who had her students do an essay very similar like this but it was you have discovered for yourself uh, that life is uh, meaningless and now subscribe to existentialism, which leads you to suicide, write a letter <laughs> describing to your parents why you have decided to commit suicide and how your existentialist thought process led you there. They this was for fourth suicide? graders. This was for fourth graders. And to be fair, it was very controversial in France. She ended up pulling, and she got lots of criticism in the press. And, uh, but uh, you know, that's an example of empathy trying to get into Juliet's mind. Like, Why would that be romantic? Why would that be something desirable? Have students write an essay or journal entry on the pros and cons of our current popular vote system and to consider the value, if any, of the electoral college. People are talking about that today, but also put yourself in the mindset of a group of people who would create an electoral college. Put yourself in the mindset of people who didn't think senators should be elected by popular vote. We're like, well, that's horrible. That's not democratic. That's bad. I dismiss that as out of hand. I'm not going to think about it more than five seconds. But put yourself into that mindset. What leads people to think that way? Is there anything that we can do to empathize with that kind of thinking? Again, that feels tricky to me because I don't want to introduce bad things to students and then push them into agreeing with those bad things. I don't, I don't want to do that. But these are examples of real life examples of things that have been done. People talked about service learning. Uh, Wiggins and McTighe talk about an intellectual outward bound. 
And then this is long, but there's a physics teacher, a physics professor, who thought, well, I'm in physics. You know, how can I possibly teach empathy? And realized, as he was thinking about it, that he could talk about different physicists and how they reacted. Did they share their research with others? Did they guard it jealously? Uh, were they vain? Were they noble in pursuit of the truth, the betterment of society? And he was able to create uh, lectures and some activities around that as he was teaching principles of physics to his students. So it's not just a humanities thing. I think it's pretty easy for us in humanities, health sciences, you know, social sciences to talk about empathy. But I do want to bring across the point that it's very much possible anywhere in engineering, in ISAD, computer science, biology, uh, it's very possible to, to teach. So we've got four minutes. <laughs> So if you want to quickly jot down an idea, maybe about an activity, a classroom activity, maybe an assessment, maybe an assignment that could be engaged in some meaningful way in empathic thinking or empathy-based learning. Okay, I know that wasn't really enough time to really get into this activity, but I hope that you'll leave today having these thoughts buzzing in your head so that you can keep thinking about what kinds of assignments could get you to that point where the students are making the bridge, whether it's to the elderly or whether it's just people who died a long time ago or whether it's just somebody different from them culturally or in some other way. They will want to share the last 45 seconds or so we have, maybe a thought or an activity? Yeah. Uh, we have, I don't know if you're familiar with study group. Uh, study group are students who haven't been related yet because of their, their focus scores are not yet high enough, but they take parallel general education classes and my matriculate Jamie students said, why can I take a class and I, with these ISC students? And so the idea would be, why not? They could, they could both learn and I think it would be valuable for both our traditional JME students from Northern Virginia and to actually learn and work with students, ISC students these days are more from um, Asia, particularly from China. And so actually having them take the same class and learn the material and work in groups together I think would be beneficial to both in terms yeah, of absolutely. building their empathy and yeah. seeing perspectives of others. I think it was Wiggins and Matai who talked about group work and they had an East Asian student and they would all discuss their answers to a, to a math problem and he never said anything. And then they would say, well, what, what's the answer? And he would say, well, it's, it's this. You guys have been doing it you know, wrong. And they said, why did you say 45 minutes? We've been working on this. You've been sitting here. You had the answer. And he said, well, in my culture, it's not polite to tell people they're wrong. So I just waited until you asked me what I thought the answer was. And they're, oh, OK. So they totally turned around the dynamic. And they said, how about you tell us your answer first? And then we'll tell you what we think. We'll go with that. And that way, you don't have to say anybody's wrong. We'll just say you're wrong. And you're going to have to handle that because we're Americans, and that's not how we're going to do it. But both groups were able to learn something significant about each other. Thanks, guys, for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, hope you got something out of it, some takeaways.